listen only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I'm David Morton, a Change and Development Officer within the, uh, the Improvement Service and we've been running this webinar series for about six months now as part of the Scottish Local Authority Change Managers Network. Today's speaker will be Andrew McGowan from Aspire in Scotland, who's the Programme Manager of the Link Up Programme and he will be telling you a lot more about that in a minute. Um, just to take you through the housekeeping for today, um, there will be plenty of time to ask, answer, uh, ask questions at the end. If you have any questions, then please use the small uh, grey box on your screen to ask throughout the uh, throughout the course of the webinar. And also, if you could, could you please indicate whether or not you have a microphone? Um, that way that we, we can take you off mute and you can answer uh, ask Andrew uh, the question directly. And that way you also get the chance to follow up on any, any feedback that you get. Um, finally, this session is recorded and information on how to access the recording and slides will be available following the webinar. So I hope you enjoyed the webinar and with that I'll just hand over to Andrew. Thank you. Thank you David. Good morning everyone. Uh, thank you for, for joining us this morning. Um, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes, uh, just under 20 minutes and then we can have time for the, the questions. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm usually somebody that when he does a presentation wanders about the room, so I'm feeling quite strange being tethered to a laptop here, so <laughs> it seems an unusual situation. Um, let me just begin by introducing Inspiring Scotland. Uh, forgive me if you already know us as an organisation. Um, we are a Scottish charity established in, in 2008. Um, we're a, a charity and a funder in Scotland, but unlike other funders, we're not fortunate enough to have a big endowment trust that we can, we can draw money on. We need to go and get our money. So we get that money from the Scottish Government, other charitable trusts and foundations, wealthy individuals, corporates as well. Um, but it's perhaps the way we use that, that money is a little bit unique in Scotland. Um, and there are three parts to that piece. The first bit is we seek to invest for the longer term in the charities we, we support. Um, so if you're fortunate enough to be a charity that we invest in as part of our 1419 employability fund, the average period of investment there is, is seven years for that charity, for the charities in it. Additionally, we engage very closely with uh, the charities. Um, you get somebody like myself called a performance advisor that comes out and speaks and understands the organisation, their issues, their problems, their opportunities, so we're there to help them with that. Um, but we don't have all the answers, so the third element is we bring in capacity building support to help the charities we invest in, in the shape of 250 pro bono supporters. So that's uh, Scottish professionals across IT, HR, property, business organisation, uh, change management, funding, etc. And it's the combination of those three things that, that really lets us take a different approach to, to the way that we work with the charities. And our aspiration would be that they're a combination of that long-term support, the close engagement, and you know the, the pro bono support that we're able to improve the impact that those charities have. Um, so we've been fortunate enough to do that across 150 different charities since 2008, covering employability, the play sector, early years, um, we program manage the Scottish Government's Cash Back for Communities program and we've recently taken on the program management of two of the government's self-directed support portfolios as well. Um, so that, that's inspiring Scotland. Let, let's kind of cut to the chase a little bit of uh, today's talk which is uh, around creating the foundations for individual community-led change. Um, in this context, I just want to be clear, I'm talking really about vulnerable and deprived communities. That, that's going to be the focus for it. Um, and I'm going to start by saying something a little bit controversial. Um, controversial in that I believe that the ingredients, the requirements for enduring change in the communities that we're working with are largely there. They're not all there, but they are largely there in the shape of the assets of that community. And by there, I'm talking about the passion, the skills, the interests, the time of local local folk. The secret, though, is to find the right recipe to utilise those ingredients effectively. And through the link-up programme that I've been helping to manage for the past four years, we've started to find part of what that recipe looks like. Um, and I'm going to try and convince you today uh, of what that recipe might look like, and particularly the, the part of it which is about laying those foundations for enduring change. I want to do that uh, by firstly talking about the impact the link-up has had 
and crucially about how that impact has been delivered, what really matters in terms of what that impact looked like. So let's begin by just setting some of the, the context around this. So back in 2010-2011, uh, um, when we were thinking about LinkUp, this is what the, the, uh, the scene looked like across Scotland at that point. These were things that were really influencing our thought processes. You have things like the Christie Commission and uh, Public Sector Reform, Community Empowerment Act, Health and Social Care Integration. So they were big factors influencing our thought process. You also had key influencers out there, people like the Chief Medical of former Chief Medical Officer Harry Burns and his work around well-being and a sense of coherence. You had the Glasgow Centre for Population and Health work on resilience and the Glasgow effect. That that issue around why are health uh, indicators in the west coast of Scotland much worse than they should be, particularly in Glasgow. They should be comparable to Manchester, Liverpool, but are much worse. So all of this was kind of shaping our thought processes. Um, but we also had, I guess, two elephants in the room, which I'll acknowledge. One was we are still seeing increasing uh, relative, increasing levels of relative inequality across Scotland. And all of you will be pretty familiar, obviously, with the, the huge squeeze in the public purse. So this was, this was shaping our, our thought processes. Um, when we distilled all that back in 2011, it was telling us two things. It was telling us we need to get communities, individuals and families more involved in, in our processes and decision making. And secondly, we need to start understanding and recognising the importance of relationships, personal aspects around confidence, self-esteem and resilience. Those two factors really stood out for Inspire and Scott when we were thinking about this stuff. Um, and what that translated to in terms of local authorities, government, NHS was we were hearing an awful lot of saying that individuals, families, communities need to be part of the solution. They need to take greater responsibility. They need to be involved in decision making in those local communities. And in Spanish Scotland, we got all that. That made perfect sense to us. But we felt that too much of that was still driven top down. It was often around single issues and it was driven top down, albeit it might have been assets based, it might have been person centred, which were improvements. But we felt we needed to start in a slightly different different place. And for us, our theory of everything, to use a, the name of the film, was that it is unrealistic to expect individuals, families and communities to fix their problems and the bigger issues in their communities if they don't know and trust each other. How do you get folk to know and trust each other? You get them spending time together, using their assets to do things that they want to do. And by doing that, what we hope to achieve was we hope to start building social connections between local people re-establishing the networks that people say used to be there in some of these communities. And our theory of everything was such that if we could do that in the right way, firstly, some of those individuals might have the confidence, the self-belief, the motivation, and maybe some new skills to start to tackle some of the issues that they and their families were facing in their life. And secondly, maybe some of those individuals will organise themselves collectively to take on the bigger stuff that's happening at a community level. So that, that was our thought process, if you like. Um, now, I'm fortunate enough that I've now got four years of operational experience behind us with LinkUp, three independent pieces of independent uh, evaluation completed on it. We had a, an impact evaluation, a process evaluation, an economic evaluation done of it. So I'm quite confident about where we've got to and that you know, we've started to prove that, that theory of everything. Um, but let's let's look at what LinkUp looked like at the end of September 2015. Now, forgive me, this breaks every rule of PowerPoint, and I, I'm sorry about that. But I'll give you a second to to digest this picture. It gives me time for a little drink as well. So, if you look at that picture, you'll see the red dots represent the communities that LinkUp's been operational in. The most recent one is Saul Coats up in the top right there. We've only been going there one year. Um, and the size of the dots reflects how long we've been in those communities and to some extent the amount of money we've paid uh, to, to manage the projects locally. Um, but the secret part of the delivery model is in each of those communities we have a full-time link-up worker. They're employed by a local host organisation, but is, it's that local worker that is the, the, the magic. They're the ones that go out and engage with the community, they establish what those assets are of local people, and then use that understanding, harness those assets to put on this huge range of activities that you see around the outside. 
And the key thing here is that those activities are all what local people have said they want to see happening, not what our worker wants to see happening, not what Inspire in Scotland, the government, or local authority, or the host organisation. This is informed by what local people have said is important to them, and they would like to see happening within it. But the activities are largely the means to the end, because the role of the link-up worker is not just to get those activities up and running, it's to nurture and support the individuals that are involved in that, to help these activities become self-managing. It's that enabling by the facilitation bit that really is, is important for LinkUp. And if you go back to our theory of everything, the foundations for the change that we were talking about are the social connections. And you can see from this diagram that by the end of September, over 12,000 people had taken part in LinkUp, and over nearly 760 had volunteered in some capacity. So this was telling us we were starting to make those social connections. Part of the evaluation we had done in 2014 was telling us some more about, the, about this information. So in the evaluation, the sample was telling us that 66% of the people that take part in LinkUp hadn't taken part in any other form of community activity. So we, we were conscious we were probably getting to some of the hardest to reach people. Many of those people were isolated, many of them stuff, suffering from anxiety, uh, mental health issues as well. So the nature of who we were connecting with was, was really important for us. Um, but we also started to see quite quickly things beyond those social connections. And this next slide captures some of those other types of changes that we started to see happening. Now, there's a disconnect in terms of the time frame. This is from May 2014, so it's, it's over a year behind the, the last slide in terms of numbers. But you need to look at this bottom up, because the foundations for the change are the social relationships and the connections that people establish. But what we started to see happening really quickly was people making decisions about re-engaging with decision-making structures, local charities, benefits offices, NHS, seeking support and help, and wanting to influence what was happening locally. They were making decisions about um, lifestyle choices, about drug and alcohol consumption, about qualifications and training, and re-engagement with employment as well. But these are just numbers. Um, there's, there's messages hidden in, in this kind of this data. And if I take, for example, that 56 people that were employed, one of them was a woman that was unemployed for 15 years. Now, you'll be aware many of the stats say you're unemployed for 15 years, you're very unlikely to ever work again. Many of them were young mums, and this was the first job that they'd ever gone on to achieve. Um, but what we found in both cases was that it wasn't just a motivation to get a job, Crucially, there was a self-belief that they could hold down that job, and that confidence factor is critically important, and I'll come back to that again in a second or two. The, the, the second message from, from this picture is that the way we typically try to deliver these outcomes just now is still top-down. We design employability programs, recovery programs, healthy eating programs, training programs. Quite often, they're time-limited. We wanted to prove that you could deliver these outcomes bottom up. In other words, that local people and through the way that we run and engage with them and supported them could, could deliver these outcomes on their own. And from our perspective, because these outcomes have been delivered by the individuals themselves, arguably, I say arguably, they're going to be more sustainable. And that's something we're going to seek to try and measure as we go forward uh, over the next few years. But this is some of the individual change. If you recall that part and parcel of our, our theory of everything second bit was we might try and see some level of community organisation happening. Um, and this, this picture here in the next slide reflects some of where that community organisation has gone. And this happened quite early. This is a community shop in Muir House on Pennywell Road in Muir House that, that LinkUp helped establish. Um, it was it got up and running, I think, about uh, April, May 2013. It's open six days a week. It produces, it sells produce. Um, it is an information centre. It's a place where people go to meet. There's various activities are run out of it as well. All of this organised by local people. One of the foundations behind that shop was a tenants group called Trim, Tenants and Residents in Muir House. And that's an, a tenants group that we helped set up through LinkUp. And that's become a really powerful force within the Muir House and Wales, Pil West Pilton community. And it's used social media to, to, a, to a huge extent. It's got nearly 4,000 people liking their Facebook site. And in one post at one point uh, was 
connected through by nearly 19,000 people. But the crucial thing is this is an organisation that's starting to influence change within that community. It's got real good relationships with the local authority, but it represents the voice of local people as well. And that's critically important. It is a, a, a force for change within that community. Other types of community organisation we're starting to see, um, if I take somewhere like the Gallatin in Kirkcaldy, uh, one, one of our, our link-up projects, and some of the individuals that were initially involved in some of those quite sociable activities, community cafe, biking group, uh, cooking groups, sports days, some of them started to organise themselves collectively. And the first thing they did was they put on a small gala day for local kids. Um, that gave them confidence. They then got themselves constituted, started to raise funds and put on a larger gala day for the wider community, something that hadn't happened for I think nearly a decade or so. That gave them further confidence. And you know, the measure of success for us is that that community group, the Gala and Gala community group, as they're called, has started to exercise control over a link-up worker. They're telling him what they want to see happening. So one example of that is in the early days of Link Up in the Gala in 2012, we set up an IT cafe. That lasted about 18 months, it kind of fell away. But this new group has recognised that it sees a lot of its people in their community being signed and they're recognising the difficulty there is a gap in access to IT, a gap in people's ability to access IT. So they're telling our worker and raising funds to re-establish that internet cafe. They're now engaging with the council as well on the redevelopment of the Overton Centre where they work as well. But that level of organisation is, is something we're starting to see across the link-up communities. And even if you get to the level of, sort of participated democracy, if you look at this diagram, this picture in front of you, you can see the eye and the all there, which is you know reflective of that shop played a small part in some of that referendum discussion as well. So it is starting to, to, to tackle some of those bits. So we're seeing impacts at an individual and at a community level. But what is making this happen? What's delivering that impact? Um, well, what really matters, WRM? First thing is process. Process in the practice of the local worker. And there are two angles on this. The first thing is this uh, Venn diagram on the left hand side, in that a person involved in link-up has to experience it in the right ways. And for the two hours or three hours or more that they get involved in link-up each week, there are three things that are really important. One is that simple point in that week, remember this is often people that are living quite chaotic lifestyles, is that that one point in the week there is things become comprehensible. They know the time, they know the place, they've got tasks, they've got objectives, they know who they're working with, they know what they're trying to achieve. So for that small part of the week, things become comprehensible. Equally, they're in charge. Local people are in charge in managing what's happening. We're helping to give them the skills to exercise that control over what happens. They're determining how the group's develop and go forward. And thirdly, they have to get something out of it. It has to be worthwhile for them. And that could be learning something, it could be helping other people, but it can just simply be that it's fun. And when you get those three aspects working together in the environment of link up and repeated over a period of time, what you start to see is improvements in an individual's health and well being. And this is what Harry Burns former chief medical officer called a sense of coherence. So some shape or form was started to prove that his thinking was correct. The second part of the process but it's how the cycle of change actually happens for the individual. And the starting point for that is when the individual first walks through the door. And for many of them, that is the hardest point. So when they push that door open to take part and participate in a link-up activity, that, that is a difficult bit. But what that first step does is it connects that person with other people. So we're starting to give that person confidence in a social context. When that is repeated over a number of weeks, those connections become relationships and friendships and support networks start to form. So you get a resilience element starting to come through for the individual and, and the friendship groups as well. When you add on top of that, taking part in a physical activity or learning a new skill, you get another positive stimulus, another thing that promotes confidence and well-being for that individual. But it's the next step. Some people, nearly 760 of them, have taken that critical step of volunteering. And that seems to be be the pivotal point in, in terms of the types of changes we've started to see. Because when that person volunteers, and I use that phrase loosely, forgive me, um, when that person volunteers, their view of themselves and their place in that community starts to shift. 
they start to see themselves as somebody that's actually making a difference. They're contributing to their own community and making a difference to other people. The labels that are often applied to them around feckless, the work shy, the needy, those are gone. And when they start that that shift in the mindset happens, what also happens is the future starts to look different and the person's aspirations start to change. And then they start to make deliberate decisions about this stuff here about engaging with support structures, about lifestyle choices, about qualifications and employment. That's what triggers these types of changes. Um, but it's the process that is critical to that. Obviously, the worker is the fundamental bit of it. I said here, I think I said previously, that they're the ones that work the magic. Um, and you need a worker with the right stuff. And the top part of this diagram displays what some of that stuff is. Uh, we're really trying to get underneath it. And it's a combination of the head, the heart, and the lungs. Um, that, that's exactly what it is. We're going to be publishing a paper in the next two or three weeks about what that right stuff looks like. This captures some of that piece. But what really matters in this picture here is the, the two on the right hand side about the fact that the worker really cares and that they see the best in people. Those are the fundamentals. If that's not there, the worker is not going to be effective in the role. One of our workers put it, put it brilliantly. In the early days of Link Up, she was starting to understand how it happened. And she said she sees other professionals in the community that she's working in. Um, and her, her comments were that she, they see other people as victims to be saved or issues to be resolved. And what she was saying was you can't look at local folk like that. You have to see people as people that can make a contribution to that community. You have to see the power in local people. And that's the starting point for Link Up. And when that works highly effectively, the worker becomes somebody that's almost past their owner type of role. But they can have all the right stuff, the workers. The critical bit is that they need to be given the space to actually exercise that right stuff. And there are a number of factors there at the bottom of that slide that reflect what, what that, that space actually looks like. The first factor is we don't start with what needs fixed, what was broken, what are the deficits. We start with what's good and we use that as a starting point. And that engages people in quite a different kind of way. It is local people's agenda. It's nobody else's agenda. It's not the host. It's not a worker. Local people inform what the agenda is and how things progress and develop. We also make sure that we give the worker increased space to operate within. We increase the size of the box that they operate on because they have to be able to flex and respond to what they're seeing happening locally. And that includes being able to take risks. The funding bit is really important as well. Each of our workers annually has a budget of between 12 to 15,000 pounds, which they use to get activities up and running. But it's the, the accessibility of that funding that makes it really diff different. So, for example, a worker in the Gorbals, um, original worker in the Gorbals, John, when he was doing his community engagement piece in the early days of it, on the Monday he heard two people talking about uh, guitar lessons. On the Tuesday he held two heard two other people talking about guitar lessons. On the Wednesday, he took a risk. He went out and bought four guitars using the Link Up funds. By the next Thursday, he had nine people at a guitar group. So it's that responding quickly to ideas of local people and meeting their expectations. And the last factor there is, well, we know we all work within a system, sometimes many systems. So we encourage our workers to work through, round, over, under those personal institutional barriers to get in the way of change. That's a fundamental part of helping them with that piece. So. Those are the two factors that really matter. Just to conclude with, I want to bring this back to the bigger picture, if you like. And we hear nowadays, both from government, local authorities, NHS, a lot of uh, about helping make Scotland a, a fairer nation, about helping local people and communities to flourish. But our experience from Link Up has shown us that many, many people's ability to flourish is constrained by two factors. Firstly, a lack of social connectedness, and secondly, by a gap in their own confidence and self-belief. And those two factors materially impair that person's ability to take part in community, to, community life, to engage the support structures that are there to help them, even to take part in democratic processes. They also constrain that person's aspirations and ability to thrive as well. And I guess what we're saying is we need to move away from thinking about outcomes and hard outcomes and think much more about the practice and the processes that happen on the ground. And it's these three elements here. It starts by connecting local people together. Those are the foundations of which everything else happens. It's about building people's capacity to help themselves and each other. 
and knowing that that isn't always enough, it's about empowering local people to take control so they can go to the local authority, the NHS, and say, these are the services we want to see happening in our community, and this is how we expect those services to be delivered. It's investment in these foundational things that, for us, is going to be absolutely fundamental in, in delivering you know, the, the type of change that we're looking to achieve within those communities, and particularly in helping those communities to flourish. So. Um, that, that's my bit done. I've just managed to stay, I think, within the 20 minutes piece. My final bit is just to say we've got some learning coming out from LinkUp. I uh, said about the workers, I'd be happy to share that with people. We're also looking to expand LinkUp into New Year's as well, so this is an opportunity to make a little bit of a pitch, but I'm going to hand over now to yourself to, to ask some questions. Okay, thank you very much for that, Andrew. Um, I'd just like to take any questions that... Um that are coming in. Um, if you can just again indicate whether or not you have access to a microphone and that way we can ask the question personally. Um, I'll just kick off. Um, Andrew, just what we were talking about briefly before the webinar, I was just wondering what the sort of potential was for collaboration with local authorities and the Link Up programme and whether or not you'd had any involvement with kind of ongoing programmes. I noticed that you had a a program of in Kilmarnock and I was wondering if you've been in touch with the vibrant communities or whether you've been involved in any of the total police approaches. Yeah, we have been. Um, as we said earlier, David, um, we, we were perhaps fortunate enough, and it wasn't necessarily by design, we kind of three years of kind of staying out of the system a bit, and I think that gave us the space to try link up and try some of this new, this potentially new way of working. I'm not saying it's unique. Um, but you know, in the last couple of years, we've been confident in the model, and what the government who fund LinkUp has said to us, they said, look, we're confident that this thing works. We want you to go and try and spread the practice of LinkUp to persuade local authorities and NHS uh, bodies to invest in this model and try and make it part of how they address um, some of the issues, seemingly intractable issues in some of our most vulnerable communities. So I've been doing that over the past, past few years. Um, but even in the existing projects, we've started to connect up with thriving places communities. Two of our projects, one in Possel, one in Gorbals, are within thriving places communities, and we are now trying to collaborate and trying to work with others to, to spread the practice of link up. Equally, over in Kilmarnock, we have been speaking to uh, the, the council over there and the vibrant communities team, Suzanne, um, working with them. Um, they've been fortunate enough to give us space working alongside their, their worker in the past. We didn't have the right, right accommodation, so we're now collaborating closely with them. That collaborative model is important because it moves the scale of link up from one worker, some places two workers, into a wider context. So we would hope that by doing that, we can spread the impact and try to increase the level of community organisation that we, we would want to see coming out of it. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, the next question probably touches on some of that as well. It's from uh, Doreen Walkinshaw from North Ayrshire Council. Has there been any experience of replicating or spreading the link up pro uh, model to, to neighbouring communities? Um, it, yes, it, it has happened. So if I take North Ayrshire, for example, um, not, we've got a project in Salcoats. This is one of our newest ones. It's based in Salcoats Central. But we were aware, for example, that uh, Big Lottery have got their Air Place uh, program operating in Drossen. And you've also got uh, North Ayrshire and Arns uh, Ahead program operating in Irvine. Um, so all, all of those are quite close, particularly our Drossen and Salcoats one is part of the three towns. So we've got our worker now connecting with, with those other workers to try and make sure that, you know, for example, there is one piece of community engagement done. How can we collaborate? How can we support? How can we cross-reference people and participants and volunteers across the piece? I think a key part of that collaborative piece is actually for the workers themselves. Um, it can be a very isolated role sometimes for the workers, so knowing there's somebody quite close by that is experiencing the same issues and the same opportunities is really important in helping them, them connect with it. I think the other part of this piece is that some of the host organisations have taken some of what they've learned from LinkUp and are seeking to apply it to the way that they work as well. Crossroads Youth and Community Association, the Gorbos, is one great example of that. Where they've, they've seen how LinkUp has worked, how it's been bottom up, how it's given local people the space to inform what's happened, and it's taken some of that learning and applying it through its own youth work activities. 
um, and that's been a success as well. So we're seeing collaboration with the host, collaboration with other link up and like workers, um, and you know I think it, hopefully we'll see more of that spread happening as we go forward. Thank you very much, Andrew. Is there any further questions? I think that's I think that's us for the, the questions at the moment. But if you have any follow-up questions at all, then please feel uh, I will be sending out copies of the slide and recording following this uh, webinar. And if you have anything to follow up, then I'll copy Andrew in and you can ask him directly. Um, just to David, close could, sorry. Could I, could I maybe ask one question, David? Just yeah. uh, just be interested to gauge people's response. I set out trying to convince people about this approach as a basis for creating some of the foundations for change. It's not a silver bullet, I know that. It has to be part of, of, of a bigger thing, but um, I, are pe do people believe it? Are they convinced by what I've said? And if not, wh where, where is the convincing to come through? Does anyone get any views or opinions on that? Does anyone have anything to follow up on that? Just give that a minute. Anything coming through, David? Yeah, uh, Doreen's just got back to us and said she loves the approach of starting uh, where people are at, and she is convinced. And Laura McKean from Fife has also said that she thinks it really works and is very much an empowerment tool. So that's the feedback Good. just now. Well, that's good. And you know, if for those for those that you're still sceptical about it, then please contact me. I'd be delighted to to show you a bit more about LinkUp. And it's quite often with these things, you have to go and see and experience it uh, to actually understand what it was. I know that was their experience with, with government. The gov Scottish government talks a lot about assets-based approaches. Um, but the reality was they had to come out and see LinkUp operating to actually understand what a, a true community-based asset approach was like. And, and you could see the light bulb moment for them coming on when they came out and spoke to local workers, met with local people, and heard about the changes it's made. So that offer is there to folk. Um, be delighted to, to, to show you. Okay, so just to close up, um, the next webinar through the Change Managers Network will be um, on the 18th of February, and we're going to it's going to be on the East Strengthshire Council uh, project management approach that we hope to potentially offer through the Change Managers Network. So uh, tune in for that if that's of interest. Just to round up, I'll. There will be a survey that follows up this uh, that follows up this webinar just to go through the quality and see what kind of things you're looking for in future. And finally, if you can just see my screen now, you should be able to see some useful links. So all our previous webinars are posted either on the Change Managers Network Scotland Knowledge Hub group or on the or on the Improvement Service website. If you have any inquiries or would like any further information on any of this, then please feel free to contact me directly. So thank you very much for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed it and I will be in touch with further information. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Andrew. Thank you, David. I appreciate you, you organising that and helping me out with it. No problem at all. <laughs> How did you feel it went? Was it too long, do you think? Uh, was it sorry, we'll just... Too detailed? We're, we're still on air at the moment, so... Oh, I see. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't want to listen. <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm thick. I'm thick skinned, so don't worry about it. <laughs>